You guys ready? Okay, hi everybody. I'm Tiffany West. I'm Tiffany West. I'm the principal designer at uh, Unity's Labs team, also the uh, product lead on editor of VR. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. <coughs> How many of you saw the keynote demo yesterday? Sweet, most people in the room. Okay, all right. So today uh, we'll just be discussing the design, implementation, architecture, and so on. Uh, here's basically the rest of the team. We have Dylan Rakiti, uh, senior engineer. Ermir Ibrahimi, who's the principal engineer and chief architect, and Matt Schoen, who's another senior engineer on the team. Okay, so first, yeah. <laughs> They've been really working hard, so good class to everyone. So first, for those of you, it seems like most of you know, but if you don't, this is what Editor VR is. It is an open source package that runs on top of Unity. Uh, it's fully extensible and customizable. You can access and you can do whatever you want with it. And basically, at its core, it lets you edit and interact with Unity directly in VR. So I have a, a brief video. Again, it seemed like most of you saw the keynote yesterday. But just to remind you, you have a main menu. It's kind of the equivalent of your top bar in 2D. Um, and then, for example, here is the, the project view, which we showed off yesterday. And this is the equivalent of a window in VR. There's some cool features here we didn't get to talk about yesterday. For example, the front face always uh, angles towards you. So whether you have it at a 90 degree angle or if you lay it down flat, that portion at the bottom always is just facing you. <coughs> you can uh, interact with objects a couple of different ways. You can directly select them, just like you can in real life. Or you can use the ray to distance select, which brings up the manipulator, very similar to the one that you use in regular Unity. And here we have the radial menu, which I didn't talk about much yesterday, but that's basically the equivalent of hotkeys in VR. So it has cut, copy, paste, delete, duplicate, all of the things that you tend to want to do on a regular basis. We put it right there at your fingertips. So you can either swipe or use capacitive touch on the joystick, or you can just point to select basic interactions. You can also resize uh, objects and so on. So that's, that's the basics of how you interact with things with Editor VR. So why do we build this? Um, I started in labs last June, and the first thing I did was talk to anyone who was working in VR that I could find. That was kind of, that was like Crescent Bay era, and the Vive uh, dev kits hadn't even shipped yet, so trying to find people who were actively working in VR was difficult, honestly. So it was a little bit of a smaller community then, and it was easy to find people who had a lot of pain points. But the one thing that came up over and over again was they just wanted to be able to do things in the headset without having to go into play mode. Um, yeah, so prototyping what you see it's, was a huge pain point. Obviously, not being able to see the console in the profiler was also a huge pain point. Um, and so when we decided to wor bring this, work on this project ourselves, we, it was really important to us that we build it in Unity. Because there are other world building or scene building tools that are out there that are third party. But it's not, there's a, there's a gap, right, between building something in an external game and actually bringing it in and building your own game. And that's why we wanted to try to build this at Unity. And finally, we think this is the future, really. Like, maybe it won't look like this at all. Maybe everything we designed will go away completely. But like, in the year 2050, we really think that most people will be able to work directly in 3D in augmented reality or mixed reality or whatever Magic League has cooking up. Like, we think that this is going to be the future, and we want to start figuring out what that's going to look like. I want to touch on this a little bit because I think if you are making a VR world right now, or world building tool, it, this might not quite feel good that, that it's built in Unity. So I want to uh, talk about how we're supporting having everyone be able to make creation tools. That note was wrong. <laughs> I just said something that I didn't mean. But we're going to talk more about tools later on, and we also showed off some of them yesterday. Sorry about the segue there. So I'm going to talk about design and user experience a little bit. So I want to take cues from the way we work with the computers now. Uh, for example, computers are really forgiving in ways that we don't notice every day right now. So this is just a simple lasso select, multi-select. When you select something like this on a Mac, not only does it have another mode, but it tells you how many things you have selected. If you hover other other states, it instantly moves for you. And if you put something where it can't go, it actually just jumps back into place. There's a lot of forgiving design here, a, really, a lot of really thoughtful design that exists in all of these 2D interfaces. We need to recreate this level of forgiveness and intuitiveness in VR, and that's a really big challenge. 
So one of the big things that I, we take away as a big de design philosophy is the, having the ability to do everything more than one way. And this is kind of counterintuitive to how a lot of people think about design right now. They think about it as simplicity, the best way, the most intuitive way. But in reality, in, on a computer, you can, say, delete something like four different ways. You can hit the delete key. You can hit you know, Apple delete or backspace. You can go up to edit mode or the edit menu and then hit delete there. There's just a bunch of different ways to do the same simple actions. We need to make sure that you can do this in VR as well if we're serious about you being able to work in VR long term. Um, another thing, just to be aware of, target sizes need to be bigger in VR due to tracking. Honestly, it's still not that awesome. They also have to have depth so that they're forgiving. You can't just have 2D planes that people click on. <clears throat> so here's another video. This is um, showing off a little bit about how we provide sort of an artificial depth. And Dylan's going to be speaking more to this later as well. I wonder if I can fast forward a bit. OK, so you see. There, as it hovers over the view all, for example, that there's some depth in there. Actually, hmm, no, nope, wrong video. Sorry, guys. Anyway, OK, let me just tell you. <laughs> when you hover over something that looks like it's 2D, but it's actually selectable, when you hover in, it, the, a depth appears behind it. And you can select anywhere in that depth. And again, Dylan's going to be talking about this more later. So let's continue onwards. OK, so we also want to have a consistent Chrome. This is something that you get across all OSs and all uh, apps on any 2D thing now. We want to make sure that we have that in VR as well. So this is an example of 2D mockup I did for the radial menu. You notice that we have kind of a little bit of a gradient at the end, but it's basically Unity gray, like Unity professional gray. And then this is 2D mockups of the main menu. And it, you see that it has a similar color and aesthetic, the typeface. It's all the same thing. And then here's an example of what the chessboard original design looked like. Also, similar chrome, similar aesthetic across the board. And here's an example of then, again, it's getting a little repetitive now, but you can see this is what the chessboard looks like in, uh, in 3D with the similar chrome. We have this sort of pane selection mode and then a frame around every workspace. All right, and that's all for me for now. I'm going to let Dylan take it away. Thank you very much, Tony. Hello, I'm an engineer with Labs. I'm also an artist, and I also specialize in technical art. Let's talk a bit about the visual polish of Editor VR right now. So a really important aspect of designing for Editor VR is to make sure that everything's very sleek, very beautiful, and always has a function. We're not trying to put anything else into the scene that gets in your way. We want to make sure that tool comes up, you get to use the functionality you need, and that tool either minimizes or goes away. No unnecessary flair. Um, identifiable appearance is actually very important in this case, too. So whether you're uh, designing for a Firewatch or you've got a zombie graveyard scenario here, you want to be able to look at these tools in night or day, pick these tools out, identify the aesthetic, grab the one that you need if it's already been populated. You don't want that to compete, and you want that to be very identifiable with the content in your scene. Um, along the lines here, we're, we've also started using the new Unity branding scheme. You've seen that in the Unite logo that you're, uh, you're seeing here at the convention. We've got a new gradient set of uh, swatches and palettes that we're working with. And then in addition, of course, maintain performance. Anyone who's worked in mobile, anyone who's currently working in VR and understands the caveats in this case, understands that you know, we're working very hard to keep that in mind as we design this. Along these lines, just really quickly, some of the new Unity brand swatches here. Of course, the execution I mentioned there in the Unity logo. And a bit where this ties together, some of what Timothy mentioned previously before. So one of the elements that's important in editor VR and in VR development in general is space. If you've been in the situation where you're designing your scenes, you understand that the content that's out here is far more important than what it is that should be in front of you acting as a tool in that case. So with regard to this, we've approached the aesthetic in a certain way where, as Timothy mentioned, we'll say the button on the front of a workspace. That's a 2D button until you interact with it. As soon as it sees that you're going to interact with it via a highlight, depth will increase. You'll be able to go into that depth, exercise the depth by either, by either refining the slider or being able to click whatever content is in there. When you exit that, that goes back to a 2D button. So if you were to rotate the workspace or use any of the menus, none of this gets in your way. So again, that, that aesthetic is something we're trying to push through. Um, in this case, we also have a new unified session gradient. So anyone that's creating any tools in Editor VR can pull from the unified session gradient. 
either randomize each time through editor VR, or you can define it yourself. So that, let's say, you're designing a tool for the asset store, and you'd like to fit in with the current aesthetic that we have going on. You'll be able to pull that session gradient. You'll be able to use that shader. You'll inherit all the gradients for any of the buttons, any of the sliders, and any of the content that will use that. Um, in addition, um, of course, the panel highlights, buttons, all the content, everything from shaders to textures to mesh thickness to everything that's included was all designed to achieve that specific aesthetic in this case. So we try to make sure that that's definitely in the forefront. With regard to the session gradient usage, if you're designing your, your own UI for content that will, say, be in the asset store or your own tool and you want to take advantage of this, uh, it's very important that you keep into consideration the UV space. So a session gradient, if you pull it from uh, Editor VR, you'll have the top color applied to the top of your UV space and the bottom color applied to the bottom. Seems like a, like a simple thing. But if you approach this in the way that you would origami, as anyone who works with UVs understands, you get to take advantage of how it is your content is presented. Again, cohesive aesthetic throughout everything in Editor VR. And then it's up to you as to how you go about picking the faces. This, for example, is a workspace button. Picking the faces that would be stretched, that would be placed, where they would be placed, and the uh, area of the spectrum that they would occupy. Quick example is right here. If we, for example, had a orange to yellow session gradient, you'd be choosing the faces that you would be placing to be able to achieve that type of, uh, that type of appearance. Um, quick appearance here, or a quick image here, also shows the new workspace uh, obscuring shader, if you will. So when designing with the obscuring shader, your UV placement is also very important. You'll have less of a blur towards the bottom, more of a blur towards the top. So you can use this in a menu to be able to, um, as Timney demonstrated earlier, as you rotate a menu and a different set of functionality were to appear out, you can take advantage of the UV placement you'll be using to make sure that content that would be blocked at that point by that object rotating blocks out the background. So utilizing this and even animating your UVs, UVs in this case allows you to have a single menu, a single tool that can have multiple uses. And in each of those cases, it will be blocking out any of the objects in your scene as is necessary. Talk a bit about animation and blend shapes in this case. A uh, really important thing, anyone who's developing in VR um, or has played um, uh, any zombie game, I'll say, that has done a little screaming out loud, you understand that content popping in while you're working in VR is a little jarring, if not hilarious, if you're the one watching that content pop in. That also applies in this case to menus. That also <laughs> applies in this case to workspaces. Uh, in initial tests, um, it was quite interesting to see say, a workspace pop in right here in front of someone's face and get a little bit of a startle action going there. So that type of approach with animation is very important. We're trying to make sure that that comes in and out. You saw that in the demonstration of the menu earlier in the workspace. Content should reveal itself. You should be able to not be frightened by it as it comes in, be able to interact with it as expected. When it goes away, it should smoothly and slowly, or smoothly and quickly go away. Uh, we worked a lot in focusing on uh, animation hinting in this case. So in mouse over, if you've worked in web or if you've worked in editor scripts, being able to get a, a highlight state on, say, a slider field or a text input field, it's nice. It holds its role in the inspector. It does exactly what it needs to do. But in the 3D space in VR, context hints are very important because you're dealing with space in this case. So consider the workspace. When you go to highlight the side of the workspace, as Timony did, and do the grab, it's very subtle. But when you're in there, you can tell the frame thickness changes itself to denote that you'll be able to do that resizing in that case. So if you have, um, say, a workspace or a tool off to the side of you, you shouldn't need to look at that to be able to get that cue. You should be able to point over, see out of the corner of your eye that that changed, and be able to use that UX hint as a means of being able to do that action. Uh, with regard to this as well, we've begun implementing angle-based functionality changes throughout. Uh, you saw that a bit in the workspaces. Again, we're no longer dealing with the 2D plane that you'll be looking at in the inspector. You're dealing with a tool that, in one perspective, can occupy one set of functionality. So if you pull up the asset browser, as Timony did there, and you'll be pulling content out, that's great. It serves that purpose. When you grab that and you rotate it up to yourself, the content in there, in there can serve a different role. The functionality can change when it does that rotation, and as should the visual appearance of that object as well. So we've been working a lot in that as well. A uh, quick example, uh, my favorite app blender, uh, quick example of the menu frame. So that workspace you saw, that's, that's what that is before we drive those blend shapes and we do those changes. 
as we go in and we drive those blend shapes or shape keys along the way, as the road workspace is picked up, these are some of the UX hinting and, and the functionality changes that we're implementing using this system. It's, it's actually very fun to explore what it would be for, say, a menu or something like a workspace or an obscure tool. What happens when that changes shape? What set of functionality can change? How would that present itself to the user? How would that occupy space? We're keeping that in mind as well. Uh, smooth transitions and smoothing, of course, very important. Uh, going back to content should not pop in. Nothing should be jarring. Uh, we do emphasize very sharp uh, court quint expo smoothing as well. So we're not getting in anyone's way. You see your content. You use a button. You close the menu. It goes away. Nothing intrudes on your workspace there. There's a quick little demo. I'll probably end up skipping this. Timothy already ran you through this. But just to be a little bit redundant here, Again, blend shapes to reveal the outside workspace frame. As you rotate the workspace frame, the workspace frame thickness decreases because the focal element is the content in the workspace in this case, or is the menu in this case. Slides come up next. Content popping in, content popping out, nothing too jarring. So one interesting lesson learned during the process of this was the user jitter. Um, again, VR developers are probably very familiar with this in Twitch games. Uh, but in menus and functionality like a workspace, it becomes very important, especially when you need text to be legible, when you need icons, say, with thin line art to be legible as well. So we've implemented a subtle smoothing system that selectively, either with translation or rotation, takes into account the user's input. Once it passes a certain threshold, it begins to smooth that input. So if you're attempting to read the content on a menu, we're taking that into account, smoothing out the position of the menu within that threshold, and then you're able to take back control of that object. Fully transparent, you can't tell when it's happening, but when it's serving its role, it's good because it's not distracting the user at all. So I spoke to the visual side of Editor VR. Um, now let's talk about the underlying system architecture that makes up Editor VR. Here to talk more about that is Amir Ibrahimi, Lab's principal software engineer. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to finally uh, get to talk a little more about the tech side of things. Um, That's how you can see the next slide. So I'm going to start with the philosophy that I'm going with uh, behind Editor VR. And it's a little non-standard to some of the component-based uh, development that you're probably used to in Unity. And I'll say because it's, it's supposed to be a developer, uh, like, well, because, because it's supposed to be a platform that developers will extend and build on, I wanted to make some decisions that would allow for this extensibility over long term. Um, so some of the things that, uh, and some of these we're still trying to find names for, I'm sure there are, we haven't done a lot of, we haven't had, we've been busy working, so I'm sure there are probably better names for these or uh, I mean, in some cases, I know of patterns that are like these, but I just, uh, I know like our concepts are not necessarily new. It's just the, the way we're kind of uh, bringing them together, which, um, uh, yeah, is interesting to me right now. Um, one of the things is hierarchical responsibility. So this is uh, in, designing, uh, in designing the classes or, in, in our case, interfaces for how the system will work. And you know, I, previous uh, in my previous company that I co-founded, you know, we were we wanted to get away from singletons, and um, and uh, what at that time what I was looking at, what I found interesting was to basically not move laterally or upward in uh, in class hierarchies. So if I have um, if I have a UI, you know, a UI class, and I'm giving it all the information that it needs to operate that there isn't going to be reaching up above to a sound manager and, or, a, uh, or any other singleton. And there's not going to be lateral movement aside from like across to other classes in, you know, in, the, same, uh, in the same space. And <clears throat> so with Editor VR, I, I, the, one of the philosophies is that it can be messy for us behind the scenes. But when, when it comes down to the tool developer who's implementing a tool, we really don't want you to have to be concerned about touching a bunch of different systems. And um, yeah, I, I, it's just that, you know, to take those same tools and bring them to potentially to, you know, a built player that you're going to release, um, 
we want that to happen, and we don't want you to have to re-architect something that you've built for editor VR when you move it to something else. Um, so uh, this, the architecture, which you'll see at some point when you know, we have our code out, it's inspired by dependency injection and, and version of control. But one of the things I didn't like about, about those approaches is that they usually require, and this is another point, that usually you have to register. You've got to register your class with some kind of uh, uh, factory manager or some kind of manager that's sitting up high. And in editor VR, you know, because we're in C Sharp, we make heavy use of reflections. So simply by implementing iTool, you're going to end up, you'll be picked up in the menu. It'll just basically, um, yeah, there is no registration. And the neat part about that is if, uh, if you want to end up, and I, I envision that some of these tools you'll probably just want to throw into your, your game, as long as you, um, uh, you, you might be able to grab similar components out of the editor VR, uh, like the main editor VR module, um, if, if you want to register uh, a, a tool in your own game. Um, uh, but you have that flexibility where you can, I mean, you, you could use reflection for that. Um, but you could also just use it directly if you just wanted to put a mono behavior with uh, that is a tool. Um, this isn't going to make much sense right now. I'm realizing that. So let me just get through these parts, and then I'll, I'll jump into uh, more, you know, more visual slides. So uh, we make heavy use of interfaces in Editor VR. And it's somewhat in a non-standard way. I would say that if you're familiar with the decorator pattern, it's kind of like that, but not exactly. Um, basically, interfaces are used both to um, set contracts for the classes that you create in Editor VR if, if, the, uh, if your tool has to provide something to the system. But it also works in reverse. So if you're needing a service from Editor VR, you're going to implement an interface. And we're basically going to attach methods for that, for you to uh, consume those services. Um, and then one of the things that came up early in our design discussions was that an interface we have, we wanted th that interface to have a single response, you know, using a single responsibility principle. So, uh, you know, something that came up, uh, and this probably won't make much sense, but in, in our input system, we're, we're making use of the new input system uh, that our input team put a prototype out. And if you're familiar with action maps, um, tools are actually make use of action maps. And uh, in some cases, you just need a single trigger. So you'll implement you know, I standard action map. You won't have to actually build the action map. But then what came up was we had, uh, we had a case where you know, well, a tool, if they want to use more than just a single button, then they should have a separate interface for that. So it'll be I custom action map. But you know, at some point, we needed multiple action maps. And the thought was, oh, well, we can just make an array on I custom action map. But interfaces are cheap, so you know, instead of putting that debt onto the developer who's creating a tool to now have to implement an array, and usually you have to new an array, put one uh, stupid action map in there, you know, we ended up just having two interfaces for those. So there's iCustom action map and then iCustom action maps. So uh, still keeping things very tight, only giving you what you need or what you request, and not requiring you to implement a bunch of other crap that you don't need. Um, and this all lends itself to a new tool developer and editor of VR, basically allowing that person to have shallow knowledge of the system. And um, one thing that was cool is with, uh, with the guys who are working on the SDF sculpting, within an hour, they had already written a tool. They recorded a video for us. And I was, I was just floored that they had, that it was working in the system. Because they were kind of like the, you know, uh, first guys to like try out. We just wanted to get some feedback uh, from uh, from a dev. So, so that that's kind of that's the philosophy behind our uh, our architecture. And this is official documentation that'll go out with the product. <laughs> so uh, I had a sit down with our um, product marketing manager. It, it's JC. Yeah. Yeah. And he was just like, Hey, tell me about this thing. So I just started writing on the board. You know, kind of how things are laid out, and that ended up in here because there was not much time to do slides before 
Uh, we were working on the demo. So, um, so this stuff is basically all of the stuff you won't really care about. This, these are the internals of Editor VR. We've got a bunch of modules that Editor VR relies upon um, to provide these services to the tools. So it's kind of Editor VR is this conduit. So we have modules that, like, uh, if you need highlighting, it, there's a highlight module that's doing all that. And then if you're implementing an interface on the tool side, we're going to connect those up. And that was the part of, uh, we have a method called connect interfaces, and it takes a generic object and basically will wire up whatever you need in the system. Um, you don't have to call that, although you can now. It's kind of meta. We have an iConnect interfaces module, so if you want to get your own objects at a, a level below your tools, you can then connect those interfaces on those objects. Um, but what is interesting is the, uh, yeah, how are the, the parts that you would become familiar with are a few different uh, interfaces in one class right now. Um, we have this idea of a proxy for hardware, and we had a hard time naming this thing because uh, we don't just want to support controllers. We want this to be able to support um, possibly connect, possibly uh, definitely leap motion was in our mind about what that might look like um, so that tools can be built either generically for left and right hand or maybe specifically for the leap motion. So we needed a system that can work General, generally for, uh, and agnostically for a bunch of devices. And if you want to build that specific tool for the leap motion, you can do that, and our system will support you in that. Um, but that's more for uh, hardware manufacturers that they would provide a new proxy in an as asset store package. So our goal with this is they don't have to modify editor VR source. They don't have to fork the, although it'll be available, they don't have to fork the code base. Uh, they can just provide a new proxy. Our system, again, no registration, will pick it up, and it will be available uh, in the action map because they're also going to make a, an input device for that. Um, on the developer side, we have iTool, uh, which is you'll, you'll implement for your tools. We have Workspace, and this is a typo. It should be iAction, and that's for the action menu. Um, and I'm going I'm to stop here because I know uh, Sean's going to go into more on that. Um, and then just to highlight, so from the point of a tool, you would have different services that you might implement. So if you need to highlight objects in your tool, you can implement iHighlight. Uh, if you need a standard action map, uh, again, we don't want to have every tool developer have to create an action map just to get the single trigger press. So we figured that's a pretty standard one. You just implement that, and you'll get, if you're used to our, if you've tried our input prototype, you'll just get a was pressed method that you can call. Um, and then if you need the menu origins of the proxy, and this is, again, abstracted, so on, on the touch, you know, the, the main menu button, or like the ray is at a different location on the, than, the, uh, than the Vive controllers. You don't need to know that. We don't want you to have to know that in the tools. So we provide uh, transforms so you can just attach things to the controller in an agnostic way. Um, so quickly, the, the, what we're envisioning for the EVR ecosystem is that we're going to have an open source API. Um, and that means that you can see all the internals. If you need to fork it, go ahead and fork it and build whatever you need. And in fact, the, even the VR view itself is its own separate class. Editor VR is built on top of that. If you want to like, <coughs> just use the VR view, you can just use that. If you want to replace Editor VR, you can replace that. You can make use of the interfaces. Really, we just don't. Uh, it's, it's all there, and the, 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 I realize, you know, I'm expecting that we'll, uh, there will be quite a lot of dialogue on our forums. You know, we'll be actively managing that. Um, but you know, the, the cool part about it is you can just go off and do something cool and like, make it available, and we'll probably see it. Um, and additionally, we're not wanting you to have to package Editor VR with your, this came up in our roadmap session. We don't want you to have to package Editor VR with uh, each of your tools. We want you to be able to drop your tool in just have a few implementations of interfaces, and then it just works. So, um, so that's about that's the second point: extending and customizing without having to modify source. And we very much envision asset store packages coming where uh, people might redesign our menus and have a new menu system. Even even our menus have interfaces, so that if you want to replace the main menu, you can do that. And we did that so we can experiment with the menus and not break our whole system when we do that. Um, 
I'm trying to think. How am I doing on time? You're good. You're good. Yeah, OK. I feel like I'm running through things pretty quickly. Uh, and then we have smart defaults. So we have a transform tool, which you, you saw, like the, uh, for gizmo movement. We have uh, a selection tool so that you can get some base selection in the, the system. Uh, we have a, um, I always forget the third tool. Locomotion. What? Locomotion. locomotion. Yeah, we have, lo have built-in <laughs> locomotion. But um, if you want to change any of these defaults, you'll have interfaces for like iTransform or iTransform tool. We're still going to name that probably differently. But uh, if you provide that to the system, we're going to pick it up. It'll show up in the main menu as uh, uh, some of these base level things you need for the VR system. So that's why uh, you'll have specific settings where you can just change your transform tool. And that allows people to experiment also with locomotion uh, and provide different packages for that. So um, yeah, in closing, I I'll say that like, uh, Editor VR, we really are, we put a lot of time into building a platform that can exist for many years and support developers and not require us to rev things just so you can get a new device into the system. I mean, what's cool is the hardware uh, developer can just provide some uh, new implementations. And then if you, and basically, you know, they can provide it on one end, you can consume it on the other, and it, it's not going to replace any of the stuff in between. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean. He's going to talk a little bit more about, you know, what, what a tool is cool. actually like. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, so hey, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking more sort of specifically implementations, not just tools, but in general, how we actually made the features that exist. Um, so just right off the bat, Editor VR features are basically broken down into three main categories. You have tools, which are attached to your hand and provide um, access to the buttons on the controllers themselves. Workspaces, which will exist in space outside of your own um, body and have UI elements like buttons and sliders and things that you can manipulate. And then actions, which are part of that radial menu, which pops up on the, the hand with which you selected an object. And that pertains to the object that is selected. So you have things like copy, clone, delete, cut, um, and one or two global actions like undo and redo. So no clicking. Interesting. Um, so first, I want to talk about the input and the controllers and just sort of how we approached this idea of giving you agnostic access to a general tracked controller without needing to worry about does it work on Vive or does it work on touch. So the controllers themselves look very different. They feel very different in your hand. But if you think about just the list of buttons and inputs, they're pretty much the same. Um, they both have a, a button or two. They both have a two-dimensional input uh, and triggers and, and a grip uh, trigger or button. Um, and obviously, they're tracked in 3D, 3D with six degrees of freedom. So if you just sort of put the two lists of, si list of inputs side by side, you have trigger is trigger, grip is grip, button is button, trackpad is trackpad. Obviously, you'll notice that the Vive only has one um, uh, button button, that is the menu button, which is above the trackpad. So in that way, it's sort of as it's asymmetrical. Uh, you could obviously use the button one on the Oculus Touch if you wanted to, but making that work on Oculus and Vive would be a challenge. So we've basically just um, given you access to a trigger. doesn't matter what, tr what uh, controller it's coming from, and then you know, you're off and running. Uh, as Amir mentioned, we're using the new input, input prototype that uh, Runa developed. There is a blog post about it on, on our blog, which I encourage you to read if you haven't already tried it yet. Um, and just to sort of give you some background, I wanted to explain a couple of core concepts. So Amir was talking about action maps, but what is an action map? It's an asset in your project that you can use to define control schema. So you say, for example, that the primary trigger is mapped to a, um, a name that I call trigger. And so through that, you can have multiple buttons mapped to the same thing, or you can have uh, axes <coughs> mapped to buttons and all these different sort of things to set up the um, sort of low-level controls going into an abstracted layer. Action map inputs are created from action maps and give you runtime access to those control values. So if I have an action map with the trigger, I can create an action map input, which is a class that I can use to say trigger dot was pressed, and that's a Boolean, and now I know the trigger was pressed. Um, and then player handles are kind of like the, the third level, where it's a stack of action map inputs, which corresponds to a player in the system. So we only have one in Editor VR, but if, for example, you were making a local multiplayer game, you could have one player handle per uh, per physical controller or per player in that, that's participating in the game. And that organizes all these action map inputs into a hierarchical stack that you use to, to define precedence of different controls. So 
In EVR, we have a number of action maps that we provide for our own purposes, as well as giving you access to create your own and use them for your tools. So for example, the direct selection action map is just the trigger, um, but it allows us to, to specifically give control to direct selection versus, say, UI, which also uses the trigger and differentiate between which of those two things is going to happen when the user actually pulls that trigger. So, and then at the bottom there, I have standard and custom highlighted, because those are the ones that you're actually going to be using in your tool. The standard action map, again, just the trigger, there's a trend, there's a trend here. Uh, and then a custom action map you can have to, to capture all the rest of the buttons for the purposes of your tool. So this is a screenshot of the player handle window in Unity, um, which is giving us a sort of visualization of what's going on with the current state of input. Um, so you see I have my direct select input, uh, UX, UI actions input, and selection input. And notice that UI actions is kind of ghosted. Direct select is, is highlighted, which means that direct select is active and UI actions is inactive. So in this particular case, the re the, we're, we're controlling these active states by saying, I have my, control, my pointer inter intersecting with an object in the scene, which is why that one's active. And there, there's no UI in, in front of me that I'm hovering over, so the UI actions are inactive. And that means that when I pull the trigger, direct select input is going to get the, is going to get the input, and it's not going to bubble down throughout the rest of the, the list. Whereas if it were inactive, the control event would get all the way down to the selection input, and then we would be able to do selection from that. So I have a quick example to show you that. So you can see here, I can hover over the objects. I can select them by pulling the trigger. But then when I grab this one and it's in my hand, the hover doesn't happen. And the, the, the trigger press is not going to be going to the selection input. Once I let it go, I can go back and do the same. So this is sort of a way of contextually changing what has control when, so that you know, basically everything you're going to, well, the most natural way you're going to want to interact with things in VR is by reaching out and pulling the trigger, or pointing and pulling the trigger, or doing things that involve the trigger. So if we had a bunch of different systems trying to get access to that, you wouldn't want necessarily to select an object in the distance when you're trying to grab something in front of you. We need to be able to define a precedence for those things um, and have some sort of uh, control over that. So that's, about, that's, more, that's, that's pretty much it about input. Uh, I wanted to move on to uh, the spatial hash, which is sort of related. It's what we use to detect those intersections with the objects in the scene. So you might say, well, obviously, we can just use a collider and say, on trigger, enter, we have a, we have a hover. However, what if that object doesn't have a collider? Uh, we don't want to touch the objects in your scene because you may, you know, you may have made choices about how they're set up. And if we add colliders to simply everything, obviously that's going to that's going to put a lot of overhead in the physics system. And also, we would need to somehow disable or remove all those colliders when you build or when you press play or something like that. So one of our kind of core principles throughout the system is um, don't touch your scene. Whatever we do with Editor VR is going to be the actual scene object that's going to be con configured as it as it is in your game. And everything we do has to be somehow um, working around that, that need for, uh, for customizing the objects. Um, obviously, we want fast and robust intersection detection, because if you, if you put your, your pointer inside of an object and it's not detected because of precision loss, that's no good. Also, we're doing this every frame, because you we're trying to detect at any point when you hit an object. So um, yeah, 11 milliseconds is a really short period of time. Um, and we're using it for the direct selection right now, but the spatial hash is actually a very powerful tool that you could use for much, much more. It's basically any time you need to know if one object is in proximity of another or in proximity with the character, um, you can do whatever you want. You can group objects. You could have them be aware of each other. Um, so it's a really powerful concept to just have the objects broken down into little spatial buckets. So moving on to tools, um, Amir talked a little bit about sort of the, the principles behind how we wanted tool development to work. Um, but I just wanted to show you here, this is what a, um, not a signature, obviously, but this is what a tool definition would look like. Um, and there's really not much more to it than that, which is awesome, right? So what's going on inside the update loop or the start and wake of this, of this mono behavior is up to you as the, as the developer. And you're used to that. That's how you're normally going to define behaviors in a game. Uh, but in order to interact with Editor VR, the first thing is that every tool has to implement the iTool interface, which is basically just an empty thing that, that decorates the, the class saying, this is a tool. It's going to show up in the menu, um, and that's it. Uh, and then going along the, the line, say our selection tool, it can highlight things. It has access to, to the menu origins to know where the menus are. Um, it can get raycast results. It can lock the ray, do these things. And this is just these are, the these are the features we need for the selection tool to work and stuff that's going to come from Editor VR and give us extra functionality. A transform tool, that's, that's a lot of interfaces. I don't know. It's complicated. Um, but this is a good example of just, just keep on adding interfaces, and, and you get more stuff. Uh, the last thing I wanted to call attention to is this create primitive tool is using our main menu item uh, attribute. So if you're familiar with an editor window, for example, um, you tag the class with an attribute. It shows up in the menu. 
Um, most of the tools will show up in the menu even without the attribute, but this is a way of customizing it. So the, primit the, um, the primitives tool is going to show up in the create menu with a tooltip, um, allowing us to create to add multiple menus for different categories of tools, because we're kind of assuming that eventually there's going to be you know, a whole long list of tools that we're going to need multiple menu faces to show. And you know, yeah, if we do our job right, then there's all sorts of new features you guys can add, and that's how you're going to get them in the system. Moving right along, I wanted to talk about the inspector. Um, so there's a number of workspaces. I don't really have time to talk about every single feature, but I think this is one of the cooler ones, uh, which uh, it works a lot like the regular inspector in, in that it uses a serialized object and serialized property classes to enumerate all the properties of your object, get access to the, va the values, change the values, update, and do all the rest. So there's a lot of heavy lifting going on behind the scenes in the regular inspector that we're able to take advantage of just because of this awesome serialization uh, feature that Unity has. Um, in terms of the actual implementation, what we have is a list view with different templates per row, and each row is a property. So there may be a vector, or a bool, or an object, or any of these different types of properties that um, the serialized property can be. Um, and then we just have a prefab that says, OK, here's your vector row. The three fields go here. There's a class behind it that, that hooks into the serialized property. And it, that's all it knows. It's, it's representing a property, and you can move right along. So we've kind of done the very basics of just like, this is, a, this is what the inspector will do. But I'm sure you're all aware that Unity 2D has the ability, sorry, <laughs> the regular editor has the ability to give you custom interfaces and, cu sorry, custom inspectors. So I would say that this possibility space in VR for custom inspectors is freaking huge. You could do whatever you want. You could have 3D objects. You could have uh, color pickers that have cool cubes that you can sort of pick out things. And um, basically, yeah, you know, you're, not, you're not really constrained to just 2D GUI anymore. So another interesting interface, or, uh, sorry, another interesting workspace is the chessboard. So you've probably seen this in the keynote and some of the videos that we were showing you earlier. Um, but this is like, you know, this is where we actually get to have fun and do something that's just VR. You know, the inspector is, I think it's interesting, but it's also kind of boring, right? It's, it's, you're used to using it. The project workspace the same way. It's, there's already one of those. So um, this is the one that we kind of got, got to be creative with. And we think that this is a really powerful tool in this 3D spatial environment. So, uh, there were a couple of things that, that we had to accomplish in order to get the chessboard working. Um, for one thing, we don't want to just have a copy of every object in the scene sitting out in front of you. That's sort of like, I guess, the naive, naive approach. But if you have a scene with 5,000 objects, you don't want to turn it into a scene with 10,000 objects, or maybe even 15,000 if you open another one. So um, it's important that we're rendering the actual objects from the scene and not, um, not copies. We also need to be able to clip them off and not have the you know, not have this other scene be as large as, uh, sorry, take up more space than, than the area that you want. Um, and we also want to render them properly with depth. And what that means is that they should be able to render on top of stuff behind them. And if a, if a real scene object comes in front of the inspector, I guess if you want to see from my perspective, then it should also block what's on the chessboard. Um, so that's also sort of another challenge. And it, it's uh, the, uh, the way that we're rendering with another camera, kind of you just, it, it renders a part of, as a part of the normal pipeline. Um, and, and shows up as it would be, even though those objects aren't real. Um, we also want to be able to cull certain objects from the chessboard. So for example, you shouldn't see the, you shouldn't see the chessboard in the chessboard and be able to move the chessboard in the chessboard, because that, that breaks horribly. Um, so we have to hide things, but we also didn't want to use a layer. So if you're familiar with how culling normally works in Unity, you put an object in a layer, you set the culling mask in the camera, and those things disappear. Um, but we wanted you guys to be able to use all 24 of the accessible layers that you have at your disposal. So we didn't want to just consume the layer if we didn't think we needed to. So we ended up doing this interesting thing where basically right before the chessboard is going to render, we disable all the objects we don't want to see. And then right after, we, put them, we turn them back on again. Um, input is another thing that's kind of tricky, right? So like I said, you don't want to be able to, to interact with the chessboard and the chessboard. But you do want to be able to interact with things inside of it. I want to be able to reach in, grab an object, pull it out, maybe put it in another chessboard. So um, what we've done is, is sort of have this second copy of all of, the, of the, uh, the rays that you have in your hand that get mapped to some, some external position based on where the chessboard's been placed so that you have essentially a big giant pointer that reaches in and can grab the object. And all of that is using the same code and the same, uh, same implementation as the pointer in your hand. Uh, and we haven't figured everything out. Like, there are some unsolved problems that, that we need. Well, that we don't need, but that would be great to make this feature work even better. Um, so for example, large objects, uh, if you have a cube that's larger than the size that you can see inside of the inspector, and sorry, I keep calling it inspector. 
if you have a cube that's larger than what you can see in the chessboard, uh, all of its faces are outside of that clipping area, so it's, it's invisible. Um, also, if you have, for example, a really large terrain that sits in the bottom of the, of the world or your, your ground plane, if you, if you pan around, it'll disappear, even though from that perspective, you should totally be able to see it. Um, so those are things that we haven't really, you know, design-wise, even figured out a good solution for, um, as well as things that, that get cut off at the edge. You know, we, we'd like to have some sort of visualization that this thing is being cut in half, and it's not really, that's not really what it looks like. Um, for exa another example is uh, shaders. I think um, w you, don't wanna, you don't necessarily want all of the fancy tricks and things that are going on in your, your scene object to be rendered again in the, in the chessboard. Uh, sometimes it's for performance reasons, sometimes it's for display reasons, um, but you know it's not necessarily going to be um, exactly the same. It's not going to be implemented exactly the same way when when you're viewing in miniature. Um, and going along with that, also uh, doing LODs on these objects would be a great idea, right? Uh, these are a lot of tiny little triangles which are hard to render. So it would be cool if we had some system to just sort of pop in a, do a new LOD version of these objects and um, render things a lot faster. So. Uh, I'm pretty sure that concludes, yeah. So that concludes my portion of the talk. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you have some more questions after about other features I wasn't able to talk about, I'm happy to answer. So I'm going to give this back to Timony, who's going to talk about some more stuff. All right. Uh, we want to open it up for questions, actually, and give you a chance to uh, ask anything we didn't cover so far. But the reason I have uh, Spantool up on here, this is a tool that was actually made by one of the other engineers in labs in about three days. And he busted ass to get it in, and I wanted to show it off. And this is also a really good example, I think, of a quick tool that you can make in Editor VR. So here's the video. Do, 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 do. He's actually been working on a similar functionality for another one of our projects, and he wanted to do a proof of concept oh, yeah. to see if we could do something similar here. Timmy, so, I, I, think, I think this is the, this is the, the wrong video. video. Is it really? Yeah. Dude, this video just keeps coming. <laughs> it just keeps creeping back. You know, actually, just hold on a sec. <laughs> that is like the video that will not go away. All right. I blame Keno. I got it, like, right here. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us, guys. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Third time's a charm, right? Yeah. You get a whole postmortem just on that video. So. <laughs> it's funny whenever you can see in speaker notes, it's like you're seeing. All right. This should actually be it. You can tell by the way it says span tool instead of that video yet again. <laughs> okay, so span tool. The idea is you grab an object here that you'd want to quickly be able to lay out across a span, and then you just draw it, and it pre-populates. I know, right? That's pretty cool. How did you guys sneak that in? I haven't seen that. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> All we need to do is just John is he now here. He's back in San Francisco. But uh, I would say give easy. him a shout out on Twitter or something. So you can see where this is just, he's going to build the fence down on the outside of the cabin. Doo -doo -doo. There he goes. Good work. Anyway, another round of applause for Jono. Oh. Again, you did this. I'm thing. impressed. I haven't seen that. And also, I'm getting uh, special thanks out to people. Bradley Wires sitting in the third row right in the middle there. Special thanks to him. He did all the alphanumeric input stuff and has been working really hard on it, too. So thanks, Brad. <laughs> all right. And now uh, to go back to it. This will be coming out next month. We can't wait to see what you guys do with it. And now we're going to open up for questions. So um, pretty clear that you're moving Unity into VR. But it looks an awful lot like you're building a toolkit for a 3D operating system. And I'm wondering if you guys want to get rid of the desktop and make, I mean, even, even a 3D operating system on a flat screen would be pretty cool to take advantage of what we already know about moving through space and stuff like that. Um, I don't see anybody else doing much except for Alan Kay, who, do you know the Croquet system? Yeah, yeah. Are you familiar with that? Bit, yeah. So, you know Alan Kay though, right? Yeah, yeah. So, he did a lot of work on that with his team, and it just seems like this has gone a lot further than they went. And some of the things that they did could augment this. 
Yeah, um, I assume that just by dint of people will be making stuff using our tools, a lot of the, the design decisions we make for better or for worse will end up percolating just because they kind of get subconsciously absorbed. Um, that being said, when you're in 3D, you kind of realize that it's nice to have something to smack up against when you're trying to draw a straight line on a plane, for example. So I don't know if 2D stuff will ever go away entirely, nor does it need to. Yeah. I'll just say, um, I, won't be, I won't say we're as grand as thinking that like we're creating the 3D OS yet. That may emerge, but I think that'll be because the community starts building cool tools and we'll see that, uh, I mean, we're really just trying to solve a pain point. And actually, in labs, it's all about it being an experiment. So I'm glad that you see that that might be a potential future. It, it sounds cool. And, uh, you know, I think, it, you know, as we just focus on what's important to, like, solve right now, we eventually, you know, it'll evolve. Hey, um, thanks. It's really a needed toolkit that you guys are doing. It's really great work to see the uh, UX thought being put into the, the design and also the architecture oh, of <laughs> all the software. Um, my question has to do with um, lighting and light mapping and how that affects, like, in your chessboard when you put all the scene in. Is it suddenly baking light maps on you, or what's going on with that? And how does that affect performance? It's probably doing that in the background right now, and we just yeah. haven't had time to like turn off some of that while you're in the headset. Or, um, yeah, but okay. And yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of editor features that uh, kind of need need special handling for VR in general. Um, so yeah, turning off the light mapper, kind of in general, I think while you're in editor is a good idea, just because it, yeah. you know, even though it's not in the main thread, it's still going to tank your performance. So so I guess a follow up: say you bake light maps on your scene. I don't know why you'd be editing it though, but if you did, yeah, then it might be useful to see that hap like the progressive light, well, watching the progressive light mapper do stuff while you're in VR would be really cool. Yeah. Um, but I think that's sort of like, uh, like like Amir was saying, we're trying to solve individual pain points. So um, if it's useful to do light mapping in VR, then <coughs> we'll do it. And if not, then it's just sort of yeah, turning it off. No, I don't think you'd want to, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you have a stomach of steel. Maybe. <laughs> Oh, super awesome. Uh, my name is Lex. I run uh, NYC VRU. It's a Unity meetup in New York uh, focused strictly on developing VR. Uh, and so thank you from all of us, from the whole community, the whole world, really, for what you guys do. I mean, literally, like, oh, the, uh, pushing everything forward in, in, in Ready Player One fashion, right? Magical. <laughs> yeah. um, and we actually started doing a little bit of um, outreach to high schools and colleges and showing people how to uh, create VR, create Unity. Uh, with, with regular Unity, um, and now with this, you can go to like middle schools and elementary schools. Um, mm. I guess so my question is, I actually have my, my two-year-old and four-year-old are always in VR, and they actually make a lot of VR. Um, what, is, what is your experience with like kids? Do you think you, uh, yeah, that will ever be? That. Have you guys ever tested it in the labs? Do you have like, you know, baby labs or whatever? We have not tested it on a child. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty cool if your kids can build stuff in Unity and they yeah. don't even need to know how to use uh, any of the current windows or, yeah, I mean, it would yeah, be Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And it's yeah, cross absolutely. cultural, cross language. I mean, anybody with eyes and hands <laughs> yeah. can now build in Unity. I yeah. mean, that yeah, is, exactly. that's absolute magic. So that's thank you. Yeah, I was going to say also, um, it, it even goes to the point earlier about like making a 3D OS or making a VR OS or whatever that uh, I've just found that that hand, like six degree of freedom track controllers is like a huge leap forward, even without the HMD, even without like a whole lot of UI stuff to um, kind of make it prettier, make it more easy to use. It's, it's what we're used to doing with our hands, you know, reach out and grab. So there's no, there's no like second level abstraction where you're moving mouse pointer around or you're sort of like thinking about it as this other thing. It's just, it's just reality, so. And you guys said on uh, December it's going to be available and open source or just available? Like no, it'll be both? available with source. Yeah, and open source. source. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. So I have uh, kind of two questions that maybe dig into the design philosophy here a little bit. Um, uh, how, how much of this can be broken out and just used in a game? I mean, it, it's just... All of it, right? Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. um, you're building these really great UI tools that, you know, are very similar to uh, something you might see in, like, a painting app, right, um, that can be used really anywhere. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, so I guess an, another question I have then is, is how can this be used uh, when 
debugging because like this solves one pain point when working on desktop, but like if you're creating an app for PSVR or Gear VR, like can I can I take the profiler with me? Yes. Right? Yeah? Sort of. Well, well sort of. Sort of. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interaction is limited at this point, but yes, the profiler and the console are in there. No, no, but um, he wants to put it in, in his game. In, yeah. Like on device. Oh. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, time. I haven't been in, like, I don't follow the PS4 team as much. I don't know, I don't think we have remoting with uh, development. Um, but uh, I think our profiler APIs we, might you, be able You can do remote profiling, yeah, yeah like yeah. On, a, on Android and stuff, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things that I'm looking forward to doing, or is one of us doing, or maybe the community does it, I don't know, uh, is that right now the profilers just were grabbing the window. What I'd love to see is uh, all the APIs are available underneath. It just takes some time, but like actually create a, a workspace profiler. Gotcha. Where okay. you can see a lot, like you can do some cool visualization stuff with that. Cool, thanks. Yeah, and I want to take your other point real quick because yeah. uh, uh, because of the interface usage, like we're hoping to eventually p potentially have a, 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 a stub of editor VR runtime that can go with uh, yeah. go into your app. It's it's just a longer term. It's not on. You know, it's not in our immediate roadmap. But any of you could like wire up your interfaces to your own highlight module and doesn't change the tool. Don't have to rewrite the code. So. Yeah, we've been building it with that use case specifically in mind that we should okay. be able to take tools and put them in a runtime and in a in a player. Yeah, gotcha. Cool. Thank you. I have two questions, both kind of UX specific. The first is, have you guys done any experiments with haptic and audio feedback as it relates to the interface? And the second is, have you guys played around with trying to have the controllers override as an HID device so that if you ha do have to go back into 2D, you lift up and it basically becomes the mouse pointer so you don't have to put the controllers down. That's really cool. Hmm. You should do that. Uh, <laughs> I, will say, I will say that the Razer Hydra does that. It, it emulates a mouse and I hate it. Uh. <laughs> um, so yeah, that may just not be necessarily the best way to do it. Um, but yeah, definitely that interplay is going to be important. Uh, we have done some early testing with uh, sound. None of that is actually going to be in what's released in December, likely. Uh, but there is an initial pass that we're working on with that. Um, I was going to say, we haven't tested it. But Dylan's made it. That's a good <laughs> way of putting it. So. Yeah, it, it yeah. didn't make it in for the presentation. <clears throat> but uh, we, we are working on that right now. And there's uh, ex experiments with haptic in its infancy right now. We really wanted to nail down the aesthetic and sort of the UI, UX philosophy and paradigm before we push too much of that out. That being said, there are places where we definitely need it, like the radial menu. We really need to have some haptic quick, quick, feedback quick. in there for it to be more usable than it is now. Thanks. Uh, will you guys be blogging about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say also thanks for, and it's a breath of fresh air to know that there's going to be uh, dependency injection and IOC principles that are going to be in the design patterns. It's something I could definitely appreciate. Yeah, yep. To not have a lot of hard dependency is in wow. yeah. brittle well, code. For dependency injection. <laughs> well, it's not dependency injection. That's what I'm saying. It's just it's just wired, inspired by. Inspired yeah. by. Yeah. Right, right. But I'll tell you, it was like trying to debug the main menu, being able to like rip the menu out, leave yep. not like leave all of Editor VR behind, and just wire up my interfaces. I like it cut right. down my iteration time. Yeah, unit right. testing right. is awesome with this type of yeah. approach, of course. Right, of course, yeah. Um, second one I want to bring up, I guess, is one of my, I, I've, I've thought about this as well, and it's one of my literary influences <laughs> as well. Um, so in Philip K. Dick's uh, mm -hmm. uh, The Stigmata of Paul Muraldricht, yep. they build these layouts, basically these dollhouses, and then using something candy, they go into these dollhouses and they experience the life of the person itself. So. Uh, using the new Unity scene collaboration tools, mm -hmm. would you be doing something like this in augmented reality with multiple people putting together a level? Yeah, that's the dream. Yeah, for sure. If we can get multi I mean, I would love to have multiplayer yeah. right now. So, so it's just a matter of So I will say this is super easy. Don't worry about it. If, are the scene fusion guys here? Okay, so scene fusion is this multi editing, uh, multi user editing tool that you, works in Unity. I'm almost convinced it might just work right now in editor VR. Like, just because it's, we're the editor. So, I mean, it's like, <laughs> and they're going to handle a layer, and it would just show up. Like, you just see stuff moving in the scene. I just haven't had time to try it out. We'll be what, trying it out soon. Uh, what, about, uh, what about, like, the war room type of stuff? Like, you've got everything laid out on the table, and, like, I'm talking about, like, like physical table, like, 
a wood table, right? And you're using augmented reality to arrange stuff together with multiple people so you yeah. can see the actual person like flesh and bone. As soon as the hardware is there in a useful way, not just one $3,000 dev kit, we will start seriously developing for augmented reality. But right now, honestly, we just don't have the hardware to try. And then it's going to be editor VRAR. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the dream. Or XR, right? That was yeah. the, I saw so that term for around. We're actually out of time, so we're just going to take one more question. Sorry. I, Sorry we'll about that, but come and we'll grab the We'll be outside or... Uh, we'll yeah, we'll be around if you guys have questions. individuals. I'll make it quick. Um, my question is about the workflow of the current editor. Like, a lot of the times you'll be in play mode and you'll want to go into the, the editor and, like, move something around. I'm curious about um, what the workflow would be during runtime, whether you'd be able to bring up a chessboard or be able to manipulate the scene and how you'd kind of switch between um, the game view and the kind of editor. The dream is that we can kind of do both, right? So, um, but we need to continue working on that. Yeah, so uh, we still have the play mode switch. It, wasn't, it hasn't been wired up in the new system. You can switch into play mode, but here's the, the key thing. is like, I can't take over your VR app. You know? like, I, I can't just bring in editor VR, even if all the runtime components work, because you're going to have your own menus. So there is this like, interesting way of like, even getting out of play mode to go back to editor VR. I have it so when you come out of uh, play mode, it just puts you right back into editor VR wherever you were. But even then, like, the only thing I can think of is you'll have, like, we'll put in the scene something that won't save to your scene, like something you can look at, and, and I'll have a script running, and then you could basically exit that way. But I, I don't know what controller mechanism you're going to be using. So there, there's some interesting things with that, but uh, we'll figure it out together. Another, another thing that I think <laughs> would be cool is it, you have, you know, you, you don't need to say, play mode doesn't have to be a binary switch. You could say, like, these objects over here, I want to do play mode on just what I'm looking at or just this group of right. things. Because we already are, like, we're, we're running an update loop in editor VR. You know, we are, it's, it's kind of like play mode at a time. Um, so it's sort of like it, it just opens up that, that possibility for doing things a little bit more unconventionally um, to suit the needs of VR. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Guys.